Thanks, Rakesh. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Absolutely honoured to be able to speak to you all. Um, if you've been here all day, you know we talked about artificial intelligence uh, and the medical field a great deal this morning. And I guess it's no surprise at all to say AI is going to extremely change uh, the future of the internet. Uh, that's not a, a clever thing at all. Um, but we are starting to discuss as society how society might change as uh, AI uh, can do more and more for us. It may change the nature of paid employment uh, and our relationship with the state as well. But let's take a few minutes to also talk about how we think digital criminals might use AI to, to really further their aims. And this is going to be an imagination about the future, but I think it's all realistic, um, if you want to bear that in mind. And I understand there are some investors in the audience, so um, consider this my thesis on a new organization. Um, I think it has high returns potential, so if you're interested afterwards, see me afterwards, and uh, just not in front of the TV cameras. Uh, better not accumulate the evidence straight away. But to get into it, sometimes when uh, reading the newspapers, we feel that cybersecurity never makes any progress whatsoever. Uh, but actually, by and large, aside for the occasional critical and short-lived vulnerability, we are at least past the days where you could sit in your bedroom and just simply hack your way through the firewalls and the defenses of most organizations if they're at least um, doing okay at keeping up with modern security practices. And uh, actually today it's true, and I think it'll be true in the future, that we've got more to worry about from imposters, imposters that are able to trick employees into inadvisable actions than we do from the cliche of someone punching their way through the, through the firewall. In fact, we know it must be dying off because it rarely happens in the movies anymore, so uh, it's got to be true. But of course, we're never going to get rid of people. There are always going to be people uh, looking after our nuclear power stations and our secure cloud services and our online banking solutions. So um, it is useful to think about how that might continue to be targeted. This is a genuinely malicious email sent to me. Um, probably most of you will recognize it as, as spam. Um, I'm pretty particular about professional grammar and formatting, and this doesn't really feel super great. Um, it says spam in the title. Some machine somewhere has uh, tried to give me a clue. It's spam. It didn't stop it coming to me. Maybe it could have done better. Uh, but the thing that really put me off is it's been sent to multiple recipients, not just me. So I don't feel Anna has my best interests at heart. And even if she is romantically exploring the world via email, she's doing so in a wider net than I perhaps would like. Um, <laughs> But human intelligence-enabled attacks are, are also becoming increasingly more common, where someone's willing to invest the resources. This is also a malicious email sent to me. Um, it appears to come from someone I know, uh, someone I know reasonably well. Most of it's pretty accurate in the nature of things that are going on it. There's a couple of typos in the signature, but I didn't notice that till much later on. Um, creepily. This is based on a conversation that Matt and I had while walking from the front door of my office to the coffee shop down the road to get a sandwich at lunchtime. So it would appear someone was hanging around our offices and targeting a group of us, all of whom have relatively public profiles with the company. So that's a bit weird and it creeped me out, but I immediately knew this was fake. Not just because I'll be enabling macros over my cold, dead body, um, <laughs> although you really shouldn't. Um, this is far too polite. This isn't how Matt sends emails to me. I knew immediately this was bogus. I certainly wasn't <laughs> clicking on the, um, uh, on the attachment. And actually, I think whoever the creep was outside sucked a little bit because when I had this conversation walking to the coffee shop, I was holding my Mac laptop, and the attack that was built into the, uh, the attached email was from a Windows laptop. So they weren't paying quite as much attention as they should have. However, in many other circumstances, this would have been enough to catch me out, certainly if it was someone I know slightly less well than Matt. So it is worth thinking about. But these things are expensive to do for criminal groups. Why invest all that time crafting something to try and get in? And I think what is going to change uh, is how AI is going to participate more in uh, what we in the community call spear phishing attacks. Let me give an example. Imagine a piece of malware on your laptop that, however it gets there, it now has the ability to read your emails, read your calendar, read your WhatsApp and your Slack and everything else that's in there. Now imagine that it can not just read that material, but understand it and start to train itself on how you differently communicate with different people in your professional life. 
it would then be able to contextually start emailing or messaging the other people in your life while purporting to be you in an attempt to try and trick them into opening an attachment. Maybe it's your laptop that's been infected and we have a diary appointment between us. Perhaps it sends me an email with, says, Dave, here's a map of where we're going to meet. Uh, look forward to seeing you there. Maybe we've been editing a document back and forth. One more tiny edit, add a malicious payload, and send it to me. Will I open those emails? Of course they will be, I will, because they're going to be contextually relevant and they're going to sound like you, unlike the example we saw a minute ago. And this is surprisingly effective. Whether we have a formal relationship, an informal relationship, whether we talk about, whether we joke or talk about football or Game of Thrones really doesn't matter. And from a technical perspective, this is going to come from your real device via your real mail accounts into your real servers and then all the way through the, the same for me as well. Very difficult to think about blocking that. And I do think this is the sort of thing that's going to start exploding across supply chains and our social graphs. If you want to go after a hard target like a global bank or someone particular in there or a specific celebrity as celebrities are increasingly being targeted, this may well be the best way of doing it. And I'd like to give an example that backs up why I think we're making progress in this regard. There is a company called X.AI, some of them you may be using it, that gives you a calendar assistant that you call Amy or I think Adam is the, uh, the other version of it. It's pretty cool, the people behind the technology are pretty cool and what it allows you to do is things like this. Mary emails Greg, says, can we meet for a coffee? Greg replies, says, sure. CC's in the AI and says, Amy, find 30 minutes for a coffee at my office. Amy understands that. She also understands his diary, when he's going to be in the office and when he's free, offers up some time slots. Mary replies, I can do some, I can't do others. And Amy says, no worries, I'll send an invite and proceeds to do so. This is pretty cool and you can all use this and I know a lot of people that do, but I'm paranoid and trust no one, so I'm not using it just yet. But it is the future for all of us. Pair this level of natural language understanding with something that's able to train itself on how you normally communicate, a bit like the Twitter bots that some of you may be familiar with, and we're an awful long way towards building that automatic spear phishing approach. All you have to do then is go and buy some actual attacks, which you will find not that difficult to buy on the black market. Do you have to have three PhDs in different types of data science to build this? I think not. I think if you are a second year at perhaps Stanford Uni, um, doing some of the natural language processing courses, you will find this relatively reachable. And I picked Stanford because you don't even have to get into Stanford to do Stanford courses. They make a lot of their courses available online, so you can sit in your pajamas on your couch and start educating yourself on some of these things. It's not even final year, it's only second year. Cripes. Um, what else is AI going to be used for by digital criminals? Well, we are absolutely sprinkling our environments with microphones and cameras. And it seems, it kind of feels uh, as a society that we've weighed that up and decided it's okay. There was a minor flurry of activity when we discovered a month or two ago that the CIA have been hacking smart TV cameras to watch terrorists. And pretty much it hit the news, the world shrugged, and we all moved on. And I can kind of get that, you know, watching me at home on my sofa watching Great British Bake Off is so low impact on me, who cares? I mean, maybe you don't like my pyjamas, whatever, doesn't matter to me. But I think the risks are different in the business environment and AI really starts to change this. We've already worked with a law firm here in London who, uh, when we started engagement with them, um, we showed them that uh, whatever happened in their boardroom was always live streamed out to someone unknown on the internet. They were never able to find out who it was, very difficult to do that sort of thing, but for an unknown period of time, at least for weeks, everything that happened in that boardroom had gone to someone else. All the conversations about prosecutions and lawsuits and mergers and acquisitions, all their high profile customers, all get shown into the boardroom um, because that was the best place to do it. Now, can you make money from this information? I think you can. You can bet on the stock market. You could potentially extort people. Um, you could probably sell some of the secrets you derive from others. Where does AI fit into this? Well, criminals in general do not go, become criminals, in my belief, because they want to go to more meetings. If they wanted uh, to do widespread harm and go to a lot of meetings, maybe they would join the government. Um, <laughs> but speech-to-text makes this a lot more tractable. 
Speech to text is pretty great now. You Google off of this API, you can stream all the audio there, it will give you text back, it will be more than good enough that you don't have to go and write your own, and then you can simply search the text for the things you're interested in. I mean, why even search it yourself? Train an AI on the things you're conceptually interested in and have it go look for you. If you're interested in M&A before it's announced or declared, just train a machine to go looking for that and start hitting hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of video conferencing units, probably most of which have a default password still turned on, and you can start getting insight into massive numbers of businesses than you uh, ever would have been able to scale to before. More targeted solu uh, solutions, if you want to be really clever, only activate the streaming if the right face is in the room or there's a particularly animated set of emotions that are going on. Um, you don't have to write that either. It's just another API that you can take advantage of and get it to do that for you. But AI is also going to enable a much more subtle class of attacks, and I find this one particularly interesting. We work with a lot of oil and gas firms who are worried that someone can turn off an oil rig, and they feel they have a lot of enemies. But if it was me and I wanted to do significant harm to an organization, I wouldn't create a visible crisis because a visible crisis can always be responded to. And if you know you're in trouble, you can ring for help, even if you don't have the skills yourself. Instead, I'd quietly and continuously change all the geophysical survey data they use to decide where to put the oil rigs in the first place. They have all of this in their repositories. The repositories are enormous, and they effectively become their beliefs about the world. So why not change those things? It might take longer to do more harm to the company, uh, to do any harm to the company, sorry, but I think it would be more costly and more damaging. If we're being really sneaky, though, maybe we don't want to hide in the database because it's too obvious uh, to get caught there. Maybe it's better to attack some of these things. Now, this is an individual submarine. It's used for collecting uh, data uh, under the... Under the under the sea, obviously. Um, typically, <laughs> um, there are hundreds of these things, and they look like little spitfires, if you've ever seen them, and they're absolutely amazing. They get towed by boats through the ocean, they all talk to each other, and they swarm really effectively without tangling up all their different wires, and they build this amazing picture of what's happening uh, on the surface of the Earth and under the surface of the Earth as well. But no matter how clever these things are, and some of the maths is absolutely intriguing, I absolutely guarantee to you they are not running Miko's antivirus on these things. And certainly they haven't had the rest of the global security community's attention on hardening them either. So I think you'll find that getting hold of these things, maybe in port when the sailors have all gone drinking, um, and finding a way to manipulate the beliefs of an organization through the information supply chain is a really um, much more achievable thing than breaking into their super hardened cloud data centers. Where does AI come into this? Well, you're going to be dealing with massive amounts of complex data that you're going to need to make some subtle changes to. And I don't think you'll be able to do that through conventional programming, and you're going to need AI to do it. Now, putting all these things together, we have a pretty, pretty good roadmap for a criminal in, uh, enterprise. <laughs> Investors take note. And I think that there's real money here. If single ransomware uh, campaigns can earn more than $200 million over a period of a few years, uh, there's clearly money to be made. AI, of course, is just a set of mathematical tools, but I think it is going to be amazing how it will be used and adopted by criminals who want to scale out just as much as we do with our conventional businesses. So things are looking pretty sweet for hacker criminals with mathematical textbooks. I started this research about a year ago, and at the time, I believed all of this was future, but so much has changed in the data science space in the last year that actually I believe that all of these things that we've discussed are implementable today. There are some other things that we found in our research that's probably further away, but I believe all of these things are things that we, we could actually build right now. Um, so taking that and responding to Rakesh's request for a prediction, here's mine. It is a bit gloomy, um, but some of these guys have got some phenomenal solutions. Um, maybe that will save us. But I think by 2020, so within approximately three years, a self-spreading email worm, we call a, a thing that spreads itself a worm, uh, like the spear phishing one we talked about earlier, based on learning about your communications, is going to start self-spreading around the world. 
I'm torn about whether it's going to be uh, ransomware or Bitcoin wallet stealing that it's going to uh, do as a mission. Um, I'm sufficiently torn about it that I wrote both things down on here and I've just decided which one I think I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with ransomware. I think it just makes more money more quickly and I don't think in the next three years there'll be tons of money in Bitcoin wallets. Um, I want to be really specific. I'm not going to name any countries, but I definitely think this is going to be launched by someone who is in an economy that is under strict sanctions. And the reason why <laughs> I'm not, and that's, you might all be leaping to conclusions, that is a few different countries at the moment. But the reason why I think it will be an organization that's excluded from the normal functioning of the global economy is you don't care about the normal global economy and launching an attack like this if you're not, about, uh, if you're not allowed to participate in it. I don't think anyone will actually ever spend the bitcoins or the ransom that they will make. I think it will just lie there for years and um, we will all watch to see what happens with it. Well, the, the, the cyber geeks will. The rest of the business, uh, the rest of the world, sorry, will not be focused on that. They're going to have their head in their hands as they discover that all the backups that they thought they'd been taking for year after year haven't worked. And I think that's the reality of how some of these things are going to go. I don't think there are going to be Armageddons, but I think there are going to be lots of hiccups along the way that hit us at large scale, like the WannaCry did, and it's going to feel really painful because we've been shown not to be doing some of the basics we really ought to. So my one takeaway, and then I will shut up, is when you go home this weekend, maybe think about your own backups because these sorts of techniques will hit indiscriminate consumers as much as they will businesses. If you're not backing up your smartphones, if you never got around to backing up your laptop and all your family photos, maybe do it now and maybe in six months or 18 months do it again because if we don't start doing some of these things, then some of these things are going to catch us out and it will be a bit of a painful experience for all of us. Thank you very much for welcoming me.